Welcome and greetings. So this event tonight is called The Power of TV, Trans Visibility in Television. Yes. Uh, we want to thank David Ambrose and the Walt Disney uh, Television Company for being a sponsor and a longtime partner. And so The Power of TV is a uh, public-facing program that we developed um, to showcase how TV has the power to address social issues with an eye on influencing our culture, influencing what's happening on camera and behind the scenes. So thank you very much for being here. And tonight, again, we're focusing on the severe underrepresentation. You can't even say representation, severe underrepresentation of the trans you know, community. And so what are the facts? I'm sure some of you know it. But our friends from GLAD are here, thank you. And uh, in a recent study that they did, they said there are only 15 transgender characters across all of television. How is that possible? How is that possible? And from the Institute, my day job is running the Gina Davis Institute on gender and media, and we always use an intersectional lens to what we do, even though we've been more female focused. And in our uh, C. Jane study of the top 100 films out of the United States, the largest grossing films out of the United States in 2018, out of 3,093 characters that we coded, there were only three trans characters, two who were trans men and two were trans women. And as you know, we watch a lot of movies on TV, so that it is really relevant to the discussion. So before we begin, um, we'd love to bring our longtime partner, uh, David Ambrose, who let me know he is a Scorpio. So just in case, you need to know that. Uh, he's a New Yorker like me, um, and his official title is Executive Director of Corporate Social Responsibility at Walt Disney Television. David, come on up. Come on up. She failed to mention I'm also single. <laughs> True story. A uh, couple of requirements, savings account, employed, and ready for love. Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, when the Television Academy talks to me about tonight, I couldn't have been more excited to lend our name our money and our support for this very important topic. Um, we, uh, I think as a community, as a member of the community, need to do more and better. I think we've made great progress, and we'll hear about that tonight, but I think we'll also talk about some of the ongoing challenges in all seriousness. So I have a very small role, because I paid for it, so uh, let me get to it. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the folks that are gonna be talking to us tonight, and they're gonna be much more entertaining, I promise. So with that, um, I'm gonna go in order of uh, hilarity. Uh, first, we have one of my good friends who yells at me all the time, Nick Adams, who's the Director of Transgender Representation at GLAAD. So this, this is, my, I think, my, my second favorite. Um, we had a lot of discussion about how do I begin to talk about the Wikipedia entry on this one. Lily Wachowski, Producer, come on up. You have to applaud at least until they get to the front. Thank you. Uh, you guys may have heard a show of a show called Pose. Yeah, right? Uh, Stephen. Canals, executive producer of Pose, come on up. Uh, the show that will never end, uh, Gray's Anatomy, Alex Blue Davis, come on up. I hope it doesn't. It is our holiday bonus every year. Uh, it's exciting that these two are part of the family um, in so many ways. Uh, next up from uh, an actress, Goliath and Transparent, Ale Alexandra Billings, come on up. Uh, 
You own that aisle. I love that. Yeah. Is that what happened? I thought, you know, I really thought Stephen was going to do a walk down the middle, yeah. but you owned it. Did I? You did. I feel better now. Uh, Brian Michael Smith, Queen Sugar and the L Word, Generation Q, come on up. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you do it. Look at that. Right. I love it. Love it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend from Glad. If you guys, do you guys all know Glad? Yeah. I have to tell you just real quick side story is I speak to Glad more than any other organization in my job where I lead philanthropy. These folks keep us honest and sometimes uh, help us be our best selves in content. So I'm really proud to work with Glad almost every day. Almost. Good luck. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, David Ambrose. Thank you, Walt Disney Television. Thank you, the TV Academy Foundation, for having us here tonight. Thank you to all these wonderful people for showing up. I mean, it's like having a nice conversation with my friends. So it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you, all of you. Um, yes, my name is Nick Adams. I am the Director of Transgender Representation at GLAAD, and I am a transgender man. And in that role at GLAAD, what I, I've been there a very long time, and I've done many, many things at GLAAD. Um, and I was always trying to make transgender representation better. But quite frankly, until about six years ago, nothing was really changing. And so I had a lot of other hats at GLAAD that I wore, um, trying to do the GLAAD Media War nominations and other things. But about six years ago, with the premiere of Orange is the New Black, that was the start of a really culture-changing conversation about the way Hollywood has represented transgender people over the years. So now I'm like one of the luckiest people on the face of the earth because all I get to do is work with Hollywood every day to try to help them do a better job of telling transgender stories and creating transgender characters. And it's really my privilege to do that, and it's my privilege today to have this conversation with these beautiful folks up here. Um, the first question we're going to start with is a common one when you have any, <laughs> sorry, I see an ex glad colleague there. Um, whenever you have any marginalized group of people who have not typically seen themselves reflected much in the media or perhaps reflected a lot but, but not in ways that were accurate and real and authentic, is you, you know, you start out by saying like, um, when did you start seeing yourself in in TV or film, like looking back at you? Did you ever see yourself represented? What did that representation look like? And when you ask that question of transgender people, the answer can sometimes be very long, and it usually is very tortured, <laughs> because we have a long, we grow up trying to see ourselves reflected back to us from a screen. And so it can be a very tangled history with that question. So I'm going to start with that question tonight and ask the panelists to say, when was the first time you saw something on a screen, in film or TV, that made you think, is that me? And was that a, it could be a good, bad, or very complicated and mixed reaction to that image. Um, so I'm going to ask them to keep their conversations, their, their answers relatively short, because that the answers to that question could let, take us till 8.30. So, um, but I wanted to start by sort of looking back. Like, what was it like for you when you were seeking a way to see yourself? And Stephen, as the token cisgender panelist up here tonight, <laughs> Um, can answer that however you wish. Could be about s your own personal experience or when the first time was you saw a portrayal of a transgender character that you thought resonated with you in some way or made you interested in learning more about the community. However you want to answer it is fine. But I'm going to turn it over to them and I'm not going to go in order. I'm just going to say who wants to go first. I will. No. Oh. Um, the first time I saw anything that was remotely uh, transgender was when I was in high school and uh, Boys Don't Cry had, had come out. And uh, on one hand, I f was excited about it. I felt like it was something I had to kind of see for myself in secret because something about it seemed like it was going to resonate with me, but I just felt like it was my secret thing. And then I watched it, and there was so much about Brandon Tina that like really resonated with me. It was the first time I saw someone who wasn't just a lesbian, and it wasn't just about sexuality, but just about who they were and how they wanted to be seen in the world. And uh, you know the, the lengths that they would take to you know share that version of themselves and live that out in the world, but it was also very scary because you know Brandon and Tina's story is, is is very tragic and what ended up happening was was something that was very possible for me or that I felt was very possible for me if I was to you know pursue any sort of transition and also in that story there there wasn't that much access to medical transition or anything like that so it it was the first time I saw anything that I was like that. I'm not the only person who kind of feels like I'm different and maybe, in, you know, and uh, could live in a different gender, but it was also very scary. And the first time that I really felt like I saw some accurate representation of myself in a, on screen was in 2015 
was when I was at the New Fest and I saw Cheryl Dunye's uh, Black is Blue. And it was about a black trans man. Like I had seen trans feminine representation. I loved uh, what Laverne Cox had did with her storyline in uh, Orange is the New Black, especially the, the, the flashback when we kind of got to see her journey to, to how she became Sophia. I thought it was so brave and vulnerable. And as an artist, like I would love to be able to explore that in my work. But there were no scripts and there were no stories that featured any black trans masculine characters. And that was the first time I saw it. And it was very powerful and resonant to me and let me know that, you know, there's such value to each of our individual experiences that seeing something that's like our experience but isn't doesn't quite do as much justice. So I was I really empowered me to like really go for telling stories from from my own experience through the work somehow. And it really opened me up to looking for that. I I guess I'll give it a whirl. Um so for me it's um it's a murky question. Um you know, I didn't, uh, because like, as I was growing up, all of <laughs> the trans characters are played by cis actors. And so um, I could tell that the, there was, it was a facade that uh, the characters lacked this certain real depth. And so for me, like my transness um, as a uh, mode of being was uh, more, I could tangentially relate more to like, punk rock music and heavy metal music and, you know, later rap music. And um, uh, I, because the characters that I would see, like John Lithgow playing the trans woman in the world of Courting Garp was like, while it was, you know, very lovely portrayal, uh, there was still something, this element missing. Um, to be honest, like for me, the the, the people that I saw, the first images that really struck a chord with me were, you know, uh, trans women and pornography. And um, there was something that um, unlocked in my brain that I saw these uh, wonderful, fearless performers um, becoming these, um, becoming desirable. And I, in my head, I could take the leap where I felt like, well, may, if I could be desirable, then maybe I could be loved. And for me, that's like one of the keys that trans people have to like struggle through, you know, will somebody love me? And so, yeah, that's, that's my answer, Nick Adams. That's an excellent answer, Lily Wachowski. Who else? I know y'all aren't shy. Um, I, the, sorry, no, go ahead. No. Fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Please. you. Uh, I, uh, what was the tokenized cis <laughs> version of the question? Yeah, token cis person on the panel. Um, I, I'm going to be difficult and say I think that that question is really complicated and it should be complicated for all of us because we're all intersectional beings. Um, and I know that we're talking about trans storytelling here, but if I'm thinking about my queer identity, I can't separate that from also being a person of color. Um, and so all that to say that uh, I think the first time that I saw representation that was significant, that had any resonance for me, was my best friend who was here said, girl, you got to watch this show. It's called Noah's Ark. And that was probably the first time for me. Because up until that point, I don't think, I think most representations of uh, queerness were, it was typically white cis gay men, um, which certainly served a purpose, I think, for someone who was stepping into their queer identity at a young age, but I never really felt seen by any of that, so. It's up to us. It's the Alexes. <laughs> it's left to the Alexes. Um, in 1980-something, there was a, <laughs> I can't remember anything, I'm almost 60, I remember nothing. Um, there was a guy who had a TV show. His name was Phil Donahue, and he had a talk show. This is before Oprah was Oprah, for any of you children that are in the house. And uh, I had begun my transition in 1980, 1979, 1980. And I'm 56 years old. I'll be 57 in March. And so I was uh, still a teenager. And uh, my parents at that time... I had, I assumed that I had done enough damage to my parents. I blamed myself for their 
uh, drinking, for their anger, for my brother's uh, isolation. It was all my fault because I was this terrible, terrible freak in my family. So I thought, well, the best thing for me to do is leave the planet. So I got a bunch of pills from my mother, my mother's uh, medicine cabinet, who really at that time was Patty Duke. She had a lot of pills. And so I got some <laughs> pills, and I sat at the edge of my bed. This is a true story. I sat at the edge of my bed, and I was a TV baby, so I had the TV on as I was getting ready to kill myself. And uh, it was on a Friday afternoon at about 3 o'clock. The only reason I remember that is because that's when Phil had his show. It was at 3 p.m. every day. And his show came on. And I'm sitting at the edge of my bed with these handful of pills. And I see these three women that were so sparkly and shiny and funny and smart. And they had this big hair and lashes and lips. And I thought, and they were so funny and witty. And I thought, these are the greatest prostitutes I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this is what I want to be when I grow up, <laughs> is a hooker. So I'm sitting at the edge of the bed. And, I, and they start, the audience asks questions, right? Like, well, how did you blah, blah, blah. And was somebody asked about the bathroom. What bathroom do you use? And I went, what bathroom did they use? I didn't know hookers had a bathroom. <laughs> Separate. <clears throat> and they started to speak. And I, as this conversation went on, this is how little I knew about anything, I found out that they were three trans women. And at that moment, when I made that discovery, I sat at the edge of the bed and said out loud to the universe, oh, there I am. And I put the pills down. Now, the interesting thing, because I believe in divine intervention. I only speak for myself when I talk about this. Years later, 19, mid-1980s, I ended up working at a place in Chicago, Illinois, on Clark Street called the Baton Show Lounge, which at that time we were called female impersonators. Isn't that nice? So that's what we were called. <laughs> it was the only job I could get. I mean, McDonald's wouldn't hire me back then. It just was not possible. So that's what I did, and I loved lip syncing. I loved being a, a queen. I still consider myself a showgirl. So I worked at the Baton, and when I got hired, those three women and I shared a dressing room. Sherry Payne, Leslie Regine, and Chili Pepper. And those three women became my family, my chosen family. So the great thing about the divine in my life is that it speaks very loudly. And if I just shut up, which is hard for me to do, as Nick Adams will attest, <laughs> and listen really carefully and open my eyes to what's in front of me, I not only see a reflection of who I could possibly be, I see what humanity is possibly showing me and how to get there. So I consider myself very lucky and very blessed to have sat in a state of silence to allow my community to find me. That's a story. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, it's divine intervention that you went before me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it is. It loosened me up. Um, because it's a hard question for me. Uh, my, my teenage years are a haze. I remember very little, uh, like distinctly, about seeing myself or knowing myself or wanting to be on the planet. I, too, was suicidal. Imagine that. Many people are, and I was. And um, Boys Don't Cry is the first one I can think of. And it was very scary. Um, but it did uh, make me feel great. My mom is in the audience, everybody. She's here. Just to, just to embarrass you for a second. It's my mom, Susan Bluestein. And um, I, I credit her very much for surviving my, my high school years. And uh, because I didn't end up like Brandon Tina, I didn't have to be Brandon Tina, you know. And I'm very lucky, so I am here because of her love and support and my friends. And I live in LA, and it's the times are changing. And that, even though I saw that, um, there are a couple after that that are, are better representations. So it is getting, it's getting better. Yeah. I also really appreciate that um, answer by Alexandra and by Lilius because it took us deep really fast, which I'm fine with. Yeah. <laughs> um, because one of the reasons I've worked at GLAD since 1998, and one of the reasons why I've worked there so long is that, in my mind, media representations of transgender people is a life and death issue for us. I mean, if 
for multiple reasons. First of all, for whatever reason, humans are creatures who want to see ourselves reflected back to us from screens. I don't know why that is, but clearly from cave paintings till now, we wanted to create this art and this storytelling that, that speaks to us and we want to see ourselves there. And when you look to the media to see yourself and you see nothing, it really makes you feel as if there is no future for you. There's no place for you in the culture. And for trans men, particularly, we've often seen nothing because trans representations of trans men and trans masculine people who might be non-binary or whatever have been really, really minimal compared to stories about trans women. Um, but when we see ourselves as well, sometimes when what we see back to us is this distorted, not real, kind of twisted version of who we are as people, that's who we, how we learn who we are. Like we learned who we are largely from the media because we typically don't have family members who are transgender. We typically, being older, those of us on this panel, except for maybe Alex and Blue Davis, um, talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have friends or anybody. You know, couldn't find those people in our lives. So we were looking to the media to see ourselves. What we saw was could be frightening, could be give us hope, but it was never really real. Kind of like what Lily said. And um, and so it's true that uh, um, survey after survey shows that like 40% of transgender people report having attempted suicide, like not thought about suicide, but attempted suicide compared to 4.6% of the general population. Because we often feel like we just either don't exist or the sort of distorted images that the media has shown us shows us a life we don't want to exist in. So for me, it's imperative that the media do a better job of helping us tell our own stories and helping us embody those stories in a way that gives younger trans people hope that they can look to a screen and see something that makes them think, oh yeah, like, wow, I have a future. That's who I could possibly be. So yeah, I think it can be life and death for us. Um, thank you for those answers. And continuing with looking back for one more answer, I wanna go back to Alexandra because of all the folks up here, I feel like you have really been banging away at trying to make Hollywood do a better job of representing us for the longest time. I mean, you have been out there working. But in a kind and compassionate way. <laughs> I mean, you were one of the first trans women I saw on TV. I'm never aggressive or what? You, you were one of the first trans women to play any sort of trans role on TV. That wasn't a man in a dress playing a trans woman. Mm -hmm. It was you. And that's really incredible that you... Uh, stepped up and did that back when the Hollywood was trying to do better perhaps, but also still a little bit in the woods. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about what those early auditions were like or what those early roles were like and have you seen things change over the last 15, 20 years? Yeah, oh, those auditions were so fun. <laughs> so fun. I, I auditioned for a show. I wonder if I can say the name of it. It doesn't matter, Alex. Uh, save it for the book. The uh, show. The show, are those cameras on? So those, the show, it was, yes, you're darn tootin'. Yeah, there's a couple of series of books I'm writing. So, so it, was, it was auditioning for this show, this comedy show, and this uh, improv guy was the star. And, the, uh, and Candace Kane, you familiar with her? So she, she, she's just hideous looking. It's so sad. <laughs> so it's, it's awful, isn't it? And mean, just mean. And so... She was at this audition, and she and I uh, follow each other around at these auditions anyway. She was there, and me, and, and, and you, because it was an improv show, they give you a little slip of paper with a, with a scenario on it. And then you go in, and you improvise with the, with the star. So she and I, having uh, no clue as to what the thing was, or the other trans people, there were about, I don't know, 10 of us all in one little room. We get this little sheet of paper, and it says something like, I'm paraphrasing, this is a long time ago, it says something like, you're at a restaurant and you have to go to the bathroom and the ladies room the ladies line the line at the ladies room is full so you go into the men's room and you meet blah blah at the urinal yeah I, yes so Candace and I are standing at the, <laughs> at the table reading this at the same time and we've known each other I've known this child for 30 years so we're standing next to each other and we both have the same that we're both like we're let's we're going to, let's go to McDonald's. Let's just go. So we le we're getting ready to leave. And then she says, because she's such a genius, she goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have an idea. <laughs> let's go in. Let's go into the audition and tell them why this is transphobic. And I went, genius. So she goes in first, and, and she's in there for like three minutes, and then comes back out. 
And, it, every, <laughs> and I went, oh, good for you. And then they call me Alexandra Billings. So I go in and I say, listen, here's why this is transphobic. You don't want, uh, no trans woman goes into the, it's not funny, we're not the butt of a joke. You're making us, you're setting us up. It's not a good, stop it. Stop it, don't do this. And the guys, there's three cis men behind a big white table staring at me. And I finish this thing and the, uh, one of the men says, well obviously this, this isn't the show for you. And I said, darling, this isn't the show for anybody. I said, what needs to happen? I said, and I want you to listen to me. What needs to happen is you need to take this premise and crumple it up and throw it away and start all over again. And here's a suggestion. I, and I know this is wacky, but try and find an actual trans person to help write this episode. And they laughed, literally laughed as if I was making a joke. That's how far back it was. It was just absurd. And then for years, for about five years, I was in the hospital. Every character I played was in the hospital. Every character I played, look me up on the, on the, on the World Wide Web. Every, I was in ER, I was in Grey's Anatomy, I was, and I was either dying, getting ready to die, or visiting someone who was dying. And I finally turned to my manager and I said, listen, here's what's not gonna happen anymore. I'm not wearing any more hospital gowns. And I didn't work for three years. Three years I didn't work because all they wanted me to do was, and do you know last week I got a call to play another patient in the hospital? But it was a cisgender patient so I was confused. I was like, maybe I should take it. Maybe this is like another groundbreaking. So, you know, nowadays we have the, the it, I, I, you know, transparent, opened a little bit of the door a little bit so the sun kind of peeked in on us a little bit and then pose just blew the thing wide open. I mean, it just honestly changed the face of television. It's just extraordinary. So we have now several portals to, to look through and we have uh, 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 so many more trans actors and, and activists and, and uh, now we have non-binary humans that are doing uh, 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 television and film. I mean, it's extraordinary now. So I, I think as far as the times changing, that certainly is true. But remember, and then I'll shut up. Remember I told you to tell me to shut up? Shut up, Alex. Uh, high sign, Alex. Alex, shut up. So I'm going to go very quickly. Here, here's what I think. I think because we live in a world right now where there's an administration, God bless their hearts. Listen, he's doing the best he can with what he knows. He is. It's hard for him to comb his hair. So it, he's doing the best he can with what he knows. So we have this administration that's lost. Donald Trump doesn't hate us. Donald Trump doesn't know us. The people that voted for him don't want us dead. They want us out. They just want us to go away because they don't understand us. So what we've got to do is not only educate each other because we don't even know each other. We're still figuring stuff out. But educate the people who disagree with us the most. And I'm talking about education that is factually based. It's hard for us to separate our emotions, I understand that. But it needs to be factually based and come from a foundation of empathy, not just niceness. Santa Claus is nice. We've got to get serious about this revolution. And I'm telling you, television and film art is the reflection of the human experience. So if these portals are being opened, there is hope, and we've got to grab it. She's amazing. <laughs> she is. So thank you for that, Alexandra, and that made me think of a couple things. One, yes, historically, when you look back at GLAD, we have looked back and done analyses of like transgender characters as they were portrayed in history on television. And we looked at 134 episodes of television where trans characters were like the guest star of the week on the hospital shows and the legal shows and the draw and the cop shows. And uh, the most common profession shown for a transgender character on those 134 episodes was sex worker. And there's nothing wrong with sex work and many trans people engage in sex work for various reasons and some of them to survive and some of them because it's their job. Uh, but 
there was never any empathy or explanation given as to why this trans woman was a sex worker in these many, many shows. It was just a given. She's a trans woman, therefore she's a sex worker. So there was no background. And then the other way in which transgender characters have historically been portrayed is like either as villains, psychopathic, serial killing villains, uh, because a man who puts on women's clothes must be a psychopath who wants to kill people. Um, and or victims. So we're just lying on the ground in a sand pit covered with a tarp or laying in a hospital bed dying or whatever. So it was victim, villain, um, sex worker, that's it. Something to move the, the plot along typically during sweeps month. Um, not a lot of multidimensionality there. So it's not that we've been invisible on television prior to Orange is the New Black. We were very visible actually, but just not in roles that kind of showed us as who we were actually are as people. So yes, that did begin to change with Orange is the New Black and with Transparent and also with Sensate. So I want to ask Lily, um, as a show creator who, uh, as a filmmaker, phenomenal filmmaker, and with Sensate, a, a co-creator of a show, you had two trans women, um, <laughs> stop, don't look at Mickey. You had, you had two uh, trans women helping to create Nomi, a trans woman who was one of the leads of Sense8, who was a really multi-dimensional, well-rounded character, who had a girlfriend, who was a com kick-ass computer hacker, who wasn't just there to be trans. Um, was that really intentional on the part of you and Lana? Were you wanting to create a ca trans character that reflected- Totally reality? accidental. Really, <laughs> just just <laughs> random, just yes. accidentally typed out trans when you were working on this story bible? And I put my sandwich down and it on the keyboard. Um, Yes, um, yes, it was intentional. Um, Sense8 was uh, uh, being uh, written at a time in my life when I was like, you know, at this moment of um, a tipping point for me right before I transitioned. And so um, from my perspective, like know me, um, the creation of Nomi as a character was about um, hopefulness for me um, uh, because I hadn't quite let go of where I was. I, I feel like, like a lot of the writing that I did for that character was like, just like below the surface. I was, um, I'm, I'm always uh, as a, you know, in the film business, I think like uh, as a trans person, I, I was always looking at um, content and wanting something else, wanting something different, wanting something. And so in all of our films, we always strove to like take oddball turns in, in the way that we cast our shows. And I think that that was like, subtextually my trans brain working itself <laughs> working itself out of the closet in a lot of ways and um uh yeah so uh, nomi is definitely the sort of culmination of that and now i'm i'm on this other show called work in progress and the main character is this queer dyke and and all of the casting decisions that I'm making are um, in the same vein of that, but there's an awareness behind it because I'm also an out and proud trans person, and so all of the subtext that I'm putting in is, is more on the surface, so we're trying to cast as many trans people just to populate our world um, so that they are just playing, they're, okay, this waitress happens to be trans. Uh, this is a, a Lyft driver, they're trans too, and this is a minister, and they're trans. And So I think like, once we start seeing ourselves in the background, uh, you, you begin to understand that this is a, um, we're illustrating this idea that we are indeed everywhere, even on TV, you know? So, yes, Nick Adams. <laughs> That's my answer. Thank you. Um, and yes, as a total Sensate 
fan and nerd. I thank you for knowing me and everything else about that series because it was amazing. And Work in Progress is also really funny. And the one thing I'm really excited about at Work in Progress is the lead has a love interest to the trans guy. Am I correct in that? That's correct. It's um, played by Theo Germ Germain. Yes. So this is all Chicago talent largely and will be on Showtime sometime in the future. In December, Nick Adams. Very exciting. <laughs> So um, we're just sort of now leaping forward. We've, lip we've looked at the back and the bad old days, and now, thank God, we're in the better days. And although I will say this, we're definitely in the better days. Um, when Orange is the New Black premiered in 2013, there were no series regular or recurring transgender characters on television, and Laverne Cox was the first. And, well, I want to say it was the first. I think that's true. I think Candace. Uh, Correct. Dirty, Dirty Sexy, sexy money. money. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. Dirty Sexy Money and Candace Kane. She's Thank not here. You. It's fine. No. She won't. <laughs> I don't know where I got that. Uh, of course, Dirty Sexy Money with Candace Kane was amazing. Um, when Orange is the New Black came on, though, at that time, in that moment, there were zero. Um, and then in the, in the next six years, now we're to a place where, as we speak today, there are 15 transgender characters on TV in regular and recurring roles, but they're only on 11 TV shows because four, used to be five, RIP candy, mm. um, <laughs> four are on Pose, but yay for Angelica because she's going to be on American Horror Story, whatever the heck is next. Um, and two are on Transparent, so it's 15 on 11 shows. So that is uh, like an amazing leap of visibility. That's 15 times more than we had six years ago, but there are over 400 LGB characters on television, and you know millions and millions and millions of Americans have not seen those 11 shows. I mean, let's be clear, they're amazing shows, all of them, quite honestly, but people haven't, a lot of people haven't seen them yet. So I feel like there's a long way to go where we, till we get enough characters, like a quantity of characters on TV, where people can see both the diversity within our community, because no one show can even begin to represent all of the diversity that's in the trans community, um, but also just start bumping into those trans characters when you're watching your random, you know, ABC show in prime time like Grey's Anatomy, or you're just tuning in to watch something because you love it, and it's the latest police procedural, and oh, there's a trans police officer on that show. So we haven't quite gotten there yet, but I think we're heading in the right direction. And Pose is a huge part of that. Um, what, <laughs> where this came from, I don't even know. It was just like a gift from the heavens. Well, there's going to be a TV show that has five trans women of color as series regular leads. What? Um, so thank you for that, Stephen Canals. And, um, and, uh, so I, I jokingly called you the token cis person on the panel, but it is really important because... I'm a person of color. I'm used to being tokenized. <laughs> <laughs> so... Trans people, um, with few exceptions, Lily being one of them, Janet's New Deal being another one, but we don't really have our hands on the means of production, to use a Marxist phrase. We're not the ones who are the showrunners yet. We're not the network executives yet. Um, but we're starting to get in writer's rooms. We're starting to direct. But it took you know, someone like you and Ryan Murphy as allies to say, yes, we're going to make this show and put trans women of color at the center of it. Can you talk a little bit about that and what it was like to go find that talent? I mean, I get casting directors coming to me saying, oh, we have this trans role and we're just not sure if we're going to be able to find the right trans actor to play it. I'm like, that is not going to be your problem. There's so many talented trans actors out there. Can you talk about just why you put trans women of color front and center and how you went about casting these incredible actors to play the part? I'm going to go back because I think what's important to note is uh, I don't know that I can take all or any of the credit. Um, so I wrote the first draft of Pose. Here's a really quick story, which is Pose came to me in 2004 after I watched Paris is Burning as an undergrad at Binghamton University. I was studying film. I was not out yet. <clears throat> My parents grew up in Harlem. Here I see this documentary where I see all these beautiful black and brown people living in New York in the same neighborhood that my parents lived in. And it was the first time that I thought, oh my God, there I am. I think it was very similar to your experience watching you know, the, the talk show. And so my feeling was, at some point, someone needs to tell that story. I very vividly remember walking back to my dorm and thinking, that's a TV show. Um, 10 years later, I'm now, after having spent a decade working as a college administrator, specifically in multicultural and intercultural offices, where I was engaged in talking about identity. Um, so I, I come to my work as a storyteller through a very academic lens. Um, 
But anyway, so I'm studying screenwriting and I say, you know what, I need to put something on the page. I'm taking a television class. I have no ideas. And I'm like, oh, there was that one idea that I had 10 years ago. And it felt daunting. But I said, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to write it. Because one of the things that I learned while I was at UCLA is, you know, A, you have to put yourself on the page, but B, it was all about voice. And the thing to UCLA's credit, you're not focused on the business. You're not thinking about what's sellable. You're not thinking about what's commercial. It's just write the show that you would want to watch. You know, let the industry know who you are as a storyteller. And so I, taking my experience as an educator and having worked in education, I was taught as an administrator, any college campus that I step foot on, I have to assess the landscape, identify where there are gaps, and then I use my knowledge, my platform, my privilege to fill those gaps. And so that's basically what I did. And so in 2014, what were we really seeing? It was primarily white, cisgendered, straight male anti-heroes. And I was really fucking tired of that. And so I was like, well, I think I'm just gonna put a bunch of like queer and trans black and brown people in this show, and that's just what it's gonna be. And so I just wrote it very unapologetically. Um, to no one's surprise, <laughs> it goes out into the industry and nobody wanted it. Um, you know, and so there were a lot of no's and it was that, you know, the water bottle tour and the dog and pony show for the writers out there of, you know, like, please pay attention to me. And the script opening up lots of doors but not keeping me in any of those rooms and being given a lot of very coded language. It's, you know, it's too niche and it's not, it's a little too urban. Um, and then finally people just saying outright, like there's too many trans people, there's too many queer people, it's too black, it's too brown, it's a period piece, and it had everything going against it. I say all of that though, that was my really long preamble to say, when I met Ryan, <clears throat> I was at that point like really, like, <clears throat> I always felt that the show would get made at some point because a, I'm from the Bronx, I'm a person of color, like it's just in the DNA, like I don't, when I hear no, I really, the way my brain processes it is work harder. So in my mind, I was like, this is just gonna be my version of Mad Men, and in 10 years it'll get made. Mm -hmm. Never thought that it would happen as quickly as it did. But when I went in to talk to Ryan, you know, I was just at a place where I was like, listen, I just, I don't, whatever. You know, like either you're gonna be into it or you're not. Like I was just sort of, done. I was really tired at this point because I've been going s so hard with this project and no one wanted it. And it's like, you want it or you don't, period. Like I was just really tired of having to have this conversation of like pitching it and talking about it and helping you understand the world and understand what it means to be a person of color and also be black or brown. I was like, listen, you, either you like the show or you don't. Um, and fortunately, Ryan is someone who believes in both equity and equality because there is a difference. Um, and that is why the show exists. So I think it's a combination of my persistence and his power. Um, in terms of the show and centering the narratives of not one but five trans women of color and then also populating that show with um, specifically black queer men, um, because those are the people that I know, you know, and I think that there's something about that answer that feels really problematic to me, and I'll just unpack that for a minute, because more often than not, that's usually the excuse that's given. It's like, oh, well, I know a person who has that identity, and that's why. Um, and while that is the truth for me, I'm also just a human being, and I recognize the power of the medium. You know, like, it is one of the most, arguably the most intimate medium, you know, and you are asking, there's this unspoken contract that you make with your audience where you're asking them to invite you into their home. And so I understand having been a young, you know, black Puerto Rican who grew up in the Bronx in housing projects who did not see themselves, particularly in the 80s um, and 90s, what it feels like to be erased. And so in, again, coming at it from an academic lens, in checking my own privileges, being a cisgendered male um, who is able-bodied, I was like, wow, if I'm feeling tired about not seeing my story being told, then I know, you know, if we're talking about the community in a monolithic way, that my trans brothers and sisters and people are definitely exhausted. And so Pose just was bore out of that. It really, for me, was bore out of being a form of true allyship, you know, and saying like, who is, whose story isn't being told, whose story needs to be told, and me feeling like if, if, if I'm being told, if the messaging is that I have access as a cisgendered person in this business in a way that trans people don't, 
well, then that means I have a huge responsibility to all the people who I'm sitting beside to do something with that power. And so that's where, that's how Pose was born. That's amazing. Thank you for that. That didn't answer the other question that you I had know, about casting. I know, but I'm going to come back to it because I have so, that made me think of something. So uh, I transitioned in 97, and for the last 22 years, trans people have been a part of my daily life. Like I have friends, we go out to dinner, we have brunch, you know, we go to support group meetings, I run a, I run a, um, a support group for families with trans kids. Like I, I'm constantly surrounded by trans people. And yet having seen almost every piece of media ever made about trans people, it's always one trans person surrounded by all cis people. They never have any trans friends. This is also true of other types of queer characters as well. And it was on Transparent actually in 2014 when I saw the scene where Mora and Davina and Shay all talked together in a restaurant and I literally paused the television and I was like, I think that's the first time I've seen two or three trans characters speak to each other in anything. So that gave me chills just looking at it. I was like, oh my God, look, like they're actually just having coffee together in a restaurant and talking about things. And it's not just about how the cis people around the trans character react to them, respond to them, have feelings about them, are confused by them, which is most of what our narratives have been when there's one trans character in a show. And so that was amazing to me. And then leap forward five years, and now I've got five <laughs> uh, trans characters on screen every episode, pretty much, talking to each other, again, not about what cis people think of them, but just about their lives and what they're going through and their chosen family. And it's just such a gift, honestly. It's amazing. Um, quickly, because I'm going to get to Alex and Brian, too. Uh, how, did, how, do you, how did you find all five of these amazing, and how, how did you convince the network to let you cast five complete unknowns as series regular leads? Because it's amazing accomplishment. Um, I think for all of the storytellers out there, um, find someone who is as powerful as Ryan Murphy and collaborate with them. Yeah. Because here's the truth. Thank you, Ryan Murphy. Is that you know? And this is that's all you have to do. That's it. That's that. it. So just <laughs> just could that you just easy. knock it off. Stop complaining. Get that It's that simple. All right. Can I say though? Yeah. A, a year before I met him, I'd send an email to my team saying, is there a way to get posed to Ryan? Because I feel like if he read it, he would understand it and this would get made. Almost a year to the date is when I met with him. That's great. Um, but anyway, I say that to say that AFX is really supportive and yeah. they obviously trust Ryan implicitly. So when I went in and I had that very first meeting with him and he bought it in the room. So it was like, we talked for 45 minutes and at the end of the meeting, he said, we're gonna make that. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then spent you know two months waiting like oh my god he's not gonna we're not gonna make it it's not gonna happen um but when i went in like i said i was sort of at the end of the journey where i just felt like it, again for all the writers in the room i'm sure if, like if you have a team of people who you're working with you know you're getting a lot of advice and there were very specific things that people were telling me and, and i was going into me with him a week after he had won a bunch of emmys for people versus oj so i went in a little intimidated, but again, I think I just had a very like idealistic, but like I don't give a shit attitude at that point. And so I was like, okay, here's a show I want to make. Here are like, it has to be cast authentically. Like it ha we have to have actual consultants from the ballroom be part of it. And everything that I lobbed at him that for the two and a half years that I was pitching it, people were like, mm, mm, mm. he was like, yep, uh huh, okay, done, great, fine. And I was like, really, okay. And all of that happened. So anyway, all that to say that I think when it comes to casting authentically, you just need to have really strong collaborators. We have Alexa Fogel as our casting director. She cast The Wire. Um, and I specifically mentioned The Wire because The Wire is another show where they were casting people who didn't have a ton of experience acting. They were finding folks who just managed to you know, be able to embody the character that they were gonna play. Um, and she was someone who, when we spoke to her, she just got it. She just understood. And at no point did she balk. You know, at no point. I think really everyone that's worked on this show, the reason why they work on it is for that reason. Um, you know, but Alexa was one of those people who, when we mentioned, you know, they're going to be not one but five trans women, and they're all black and brown. And she was like, okay, cool. And the <laughs> really the, the longest conversation that we had, the biggest concern for us around casting was getting the ballroom piece right. So it was, you know, her feeling was like, yeah, well, no problem. I will find the best actresses for these roles. We just want to make sure that 
the ballroom piece feels real and feels authentic. Um, and so then she sent her team out and for six months they actually went to the ballroom community and they went into the Kiki scene um, and they found these incredible actresses. In the original draft of the script, there were only three characters, three trans women as regulars and that was uh, Angel, uh, Blanca and Electra. And then after meeting with all the actresses, we then created Candy and we created Lulu specifically because we loved Haley and Angelica so much. And when they left, like we were just having such intense conversations with these women when they were auditioning. And their auditions really were just, it was just conversational. Like we were looking them in the face and talking. Like we had already seen their tapes. And so we really didn't need them to go through the rigmarole of, you know, let's have you go through the scene a hundred more times. Like we already knew who we wanted. So we were like, we just want to meet you and talk to you. And all those conversations were so, uh, very emotional, and I won't get into all of it now because then I'll start to cry, but it, it was very emotional. And so at the end of it all, we were just like, like, we can't lose any of these women. Like, we need all of them. And so that's how three became five. That's amazing. So speaking of allies in position of power who make things happen, um, Krista Vernoff on Grey's Anatomy. Um, I had worked with her previously on another show, and then she called me up and she was like, I think we're gonna add a trans doctor to Grey's Anatomy. And I was like, what? Um, so I was very excited about that, and I, um, I was privileged to go in and like talk to the writer's room in advance to give them sort of a trans 101 and best practices and storytelling you know, tropes and cliches to avoid, just to try to get them down you know, the right path. And then, um, you know, I know they saw a lot of actors for that part, and they hired you because you are super talented. Um, and then what I really, really liked, because again, Grey's Anatomy is the show that's been on the air forever, has a hugely passionate built-in fan base. They let those um, fans get to know Casey for six or seven or eight episodes, I think, quite a while before. It was five. Just five? Yeah. Seemed longer. Seemed it, like there was a, a break. Happened. There was like a holiday break. And yeah. then, okay, so, but they got to know Casey um, as a human, as a doctor, as the new intern on the show. And I actually have here the line I'm going to read it because um, the foundation found it for me, which I really appreciate it. Casey says to Bailey, I'm a proud transgender man, Dr. Bailey, and I, and I like for people to get to know me before they find out my medical history. So it was an, it, it was an issue of disclosing, you know, like having the privilege to be able to choose to tell people your gender history or not, and him choosing to do that in that moment because he had a connection to Bailey. So can you talk a little bit about what, what it's like for you to play Casey coming a, a trans character who is definitely not there just to be trans and whose transness is just a matter of fact part about him? Yeah, it's my dream role as a human being to be that, to have it just be one part of me, um, that people see that, uh, that they appreciate it about me. And, and seeing the response that Casey has gotten, I mean, people are over the moon about how cool a hacker he is. and. Um, you know, <laughs> he's safe. He used like hospital. shock paddles on like a security thing on the door. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He broke up in the blood the blood bank. Um, yeah, it's it's really cool that it, you talked about privilege. Like, what an amazing privilege that is now that he could be who he is. Nobody ask him any questions. Nobody misgender him. All of this. I I when I was transitioning, I was misgendered for the first three years. Call it my pretty face. Call it whatever it was. I I don't know. And I'm like, I don't know why this is happening. I'm really trying. I'm actually trying to be honest now, and it's not working. And so I went into this feeling, um, wow, now I go get to play a guy who doesn't have to have a big reveal right away. Like, there's something about him. We all know what it is. But is he going to say it or not? Uh, it just, I'm a doctor. Um and when I, uh, there was something else you said. Um, I don't know why, but I moved to talk about Instagram. This is this is strange, right? But I am shocked I'll by. Wait, Alex. Uh, okay, so I'm. This is a. It's actually because even though it was two years ago that this line was said on TV, there are still memes of it made. It mean I get DMs from guys that are like, now I can be an actor, you know. 
now, now my dreams can come true, I see it, and it is life and death, and these guys are seen, and they're like, it wasn't just about being trans, he's more than trans. I mean, Krista was right, it's, uh, to talk to you about it and to get consulted, that is a huge part of it, like, like Lily said, you know, that it's on purpose that people wanna be seen for more than their gender. And so I get, I've also got messages like, whoa, he's so good, is he really transgender? Whoa, he's so brave, and he, he must really be a great actor to be able to play trans. I'm like, I have made it. After th <laughs> three years of being misgendered, <laughs> 10 years later, I'm a male actor, and no one, you know, no one thinks twice. Yeah, so there's yeah. been a good fan response, not only from trans people, but just Grey's Anatomy friends in general have embraced Casey. Oh, yeah, and, and w what's interesting is that they, They've embraced who I am as an actor also. That, you know, there's more out there about me than just the fact that I'm trans. It's not the first question people ask. It's not the first thing. I mean, sometimes, clearly, the first thing they ask is, is he transgender? But, um, you know, that I see this with other trans actors also, that there's becoming, people are becoming interested in who they are, who I am, mm -hmm. who my friends are, yeah. you know, who my family is. And I think that that's going to happen more with Casey as we see i have no idea what's happening so don't even ask me <laughs> it's all under wraps yeah um well similarly brian um i met brian michael smith because i had seen a casting call go out for queen sugar looking for a trans actor and i was like oh huh and then later i called them and i, I emailed them and i was like who'd you cast who'd you cast because i'd sent them a list of names like here's the trans guy actors i know and go look in these other places blah 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 and they said brian michael smith and i was like who I, could, I had this moment of like, did you hire a cisgender actor to play this part? Am I gonna have to yell at Own? Like, oh, please don't make me yell at Oprah. Um, <laughs> and so um, the network connected us and we talked about it. And your backstory was that you were working in New York, working actor, getting cast in a lot of things. I, I looked at them, you, you had either a police officer uniform on or a firefighter uniform on. It was one of those two things, doing that very, very I hit well. the trifecta. Um, Firefighter, cop, and EMS. Now. Well, there you so go. I've exactly. done my first responder. Yeah. It was intentional, though, because I was trying to get on Orange is the New Black. <laughs> and, like, I wanted to get a series regular role, and all the male roles were security guards. So I'm like, let me see. Let me put this image out here of me getting my cop on and throw these handcuffs down. I'm going to make this work. You know, that my first role actually came like that because uh, I was doing, I was like, let me get a cop uniform. I did background work. I got the uniform. I took the pictures. I got a headshot. I went to Jenny. You got your own cop Yes, uniform. I did. <laughs> Hey, with the SAG people on the on the set, like gave me the scoop. He's like, "You take your SAG card down to this. They'll give you a uniform." I was like, "Oh, bet!" And I got my uniform. I got my pictures. I was working like nobody's business because I had that uniform. And then I went to Jen Houston's office, who does Orange and New Black, and I like, you know, gave my head shot. Like, I'm down for this, you know. And uh, she ended up casting me in Girls. So my first role was in Girls because she also cast that show as a as a police officer. So I had that going for me, and I, I, you know, and I, I just I just worked it, and it was great because doing background work, it's like free. I'm getting paid to rehearse, you know. So I'm just having a great time, like playing different kinds of cops. So when I go into these auditions, like I know it's like to walk the beat, you know, a 14 hour shift, you know, be policing people at Crafty. I was having a great time. And, <laughs> And around that time in like 24. And you had your own, I had my own uniform. outfit. Yeah, so I'm up in there. I mean, we're doing them with some pretzels. <laughs> you know. So I was having a great time. And uh, I, I ended up seeing uh, Selma at one of these SAG talkbacks. And Ava DuVernay was there with David Oyelowo. And I, I mean, the movie just blew me away. And to talk about the power of storytelling and how you, when you center our own voices in this way and like looking at everybody as a multifaceted human, I was just I'm like moved. And then uh, during a talkback, she, she was talking about her process with her and David. And I was like, I have got to work with this woman. I even went up to her afterwards. I got to work with you. She's like, okay, baby, yeah, yeah. And I was like, no, you know. But I, I, I was really resolved to, to do that. And uh, I did the same thing, Stephen. I told my people, my manager, like, hey, I really want to work with Ava DuVernay. And, you know, she, okay, you know, you got to get some credit. I was like, no, but I'm serious. I really want to do this. And ended up, you know, not working with that manager. And when I got my next uh, team, I was like, hey, I, I, I saw that Ava DuVernay is going to work on this project. It's called Queen Sugar. It seems like amazing. I read the book. Like, if there's anything, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, okay, shit. Yeah, I think she was getting Oscar bus. So I think they were like, kind of like playing. I was like, I'm serious, you know, I'm serious. So I emailed and all this stuff. So I'm living my life. I'm working. I'm playing these parts. And not necessarily out, not 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 yeah. not out as a transgender director, but not being cast in trans roles. Right, like I'm, Most I'm casting going, directors didn't know. Yeah, you're just doing your thing. I'm looking for me. I really, I never. I was doing a lot of acting adjacent work for the years that I was out of uh, college. I was doing athletics for for the most part, and I realized, you know, that I took something to heart that a professor said to me in one of my acting classes. You know, I'm, I'm in college and. 
I'm, I'm trying, I was trying very hard to be like female. I had like talked to my mom about, you know, why I'm struggling so much. She's like, you never really tried to be a girl. I was like, you damn right. I never really gave it a shot. <laughs> Let me give it a shot. So I'm trying, you know, and I'm in this acting class and uh, we had the opportunity to finally bring in a scene that we wanted. I brought in this scene from like Mall Rats or something because I just thought it was hilarious. And I'm like, this is going to be great. I bring it in. I didn't even get like halfway through. And he's like, what, what are you doing? Like, why, what, what is this? What, what do you play? No one would ever cast you in this. Like, everybody, listen, you don't do this. No one would ever cast you in, in this. As a black woman, you need to find things. So I'm like, it hit me in a, in a way because I realized, like, no one's ever going to see me. You know, he gave me this scene to do, and I had to play this woman in a bar seducing a man. And, like, the first time it really clicked to me, like, I'm going to be a woman? I had a hard enough time just trying to be a girl. Like, I, I mean, it was, it was beyond me, and, like, it really knocked me off my trajectory and like trying to act something there's no way that I can do this and that kind of precipitated my own sort of investigation to my gender and I kind of tabled acting I put to the side I did teaching I taught filmmaking I worked with young people I came to New York and I was doing media literacy and drama for uh for young people and then I worked at the center the LGBT center there and I'm like teaching these kids and like I'm I feel like I want to do it I put myself in New York because I wanted to get into acting I just didn't know how to do it, and then I start. I, I started noticing. Like I'm telling these kids, follow your your path. Don't let anything knock you off your path. I'm like, yo, I got knocked off my path. I can't be telling y'all this and like not doing it. You know, even though the work that I'm doing is very meaningful, and I really got a chance to understand and like really be involved in the community in a way I wasn't before. I'm from uh, Michigan and uh, this small town, so there wasn't much of a investment in the LGBT community. I didn't know where the LGBT community was, and most of my interaction was through people online. That's how I discovered, you know. Trans, the words, the vocabulary, and everything was very online. But being in the in the center really helped me see how important it is to have someone to see yourself. Because when the young people would like, you know, when they knew I was trans, they were like, "Oh my God!" Because they could see that there was a future for themselves. And I realized, you hey, know, that's why it was difficult for me because I didn't see a, a future for myself. So it's like it, it meant more for me to really go after it. You know, after I was I was working there, so I'm 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 working, I'm doing my thing, I'm telling people I want to work with this woman, and I finally got in uh, this uh, this Facebook post from uh, Silas Howard, who I worked with at uh, the Tribeca Film Institute. And he's like, hey, I'm trying to help a friend cast this role. They're looking for a black trans cop. I am all of those things. That is all I've been playing. Hey, you know, great. And so you know, I hit him up like I would love to do this, and he's like, you know, send me your stuff. I, I sent him my stuff, and then I get the email from uh, from uh, Aisha Coley. Hi, we're casting Queen Sugar. <laughs> out of here and it was like a year literally a year later after i emailed my former rep saying that like i want to work with Ava Verney, i get this you know like thing and you know I, I i loved the part i felt like i did the work as an actor just to like improve my my ta my uh my craft and i just I, I was just in a in a place and i was looking for a role that would allow me to explore my trans experience in the work because i didn't want to just come out like hey, i'm out and just be out for like no, like i wanted to, I, i'm an artist more so than i well i, just, I, I thought at the time I'm, I'm an artist more than i'm an actor i want my work to speak to things and i would like to show people because I, I agree with you like when people see when people can take the journey that's what i love about you know acting and performing when they can walk in your shoes it's really hard to just just discriminate it's like you understand on a different level so i was like i really wanted a role that would allow me to do that but there weren't that many roles for trans masculine people, and I hadn't written in a while, and I just like I, I want to. I was like, if I need to create it myself, I will, but I really just want to focus on the on the performance part. So this this role came, I read it, I loved it, and what really just let me feel like this is the universe allowing, uh, like aligning with me is when I read the scene. It was um, I was going to be playing uh, the main character, Ralph Angel's uh, childhood friend, and uh, in the scene my character helps him out like he's he's got trouble with the with the law i'm a police officer i notice him doing something that's that may be illegal i i tell him like my friend like leave leave him alone and we have this conversation and uh i got a chance to express gratitude to him for being that being an ally to me and i i don't I didn't get a chance to do that that much in my in my real in my actual life and i had to think about like how many people actually did you know, support me. So it was amazing to like have this scene in, in TV where I'm telling this person who may not, he didn't understand the language, he didn't understand the words, but he's like, I just knew it was wrong and I love you and I, just, I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. And I'm like, 
because <clears throat> he's he's black, he is a a very strong representation of like masculinity. So to have this person that all the women love Ralph Angel and all the dudes kind of want to be Ralph Angel who's watching the show, he really stands for a lot. And he has this son who plays with the doll and he just lets him be. So it's a great model for that. And then you get this understanding of like, he just connects. He's like, you're my friend, I love you and I'm, I'm taking care of you. And I love that. And I just love that they set it up where it was it's my character who is helping. <laughs> as opposed to needing the help. I'm the one who kind of has my life together and I'm showing up as an example for my friend while he's doing and like while he's doing this thing is showing up how to be an ally. And I was just like, mm. And I the same thing with the with the emails that I get from uh, from parents who, you know, especially in the black community who may not know that much or have had that much access to information about trans, they're like out with you know, like they're talking about my, my, my child was going through some things and like I just I, I see you and like, you know, you're not only are you an actor, but like you live in your life, you're doing these things, and like I, I feel like I can understand my child a little bit more, so, or asking me questions. I answer questions from random people all the time through my, through my DMs because people want to know, and like they just reach out to me like a real person. I'm like, okay, let me, yeah, this is what happened with me and my mom and, and whatever, and it just really solidified for me the power of like being authentic and, and, and telling stories right. You know, I'm so glad that you, you know, worked with them on that because even the way that my character talked about it, it, it just made sense, and it wasn't, fake and wasn't put upon. And know. when Queen Sugar comes on, like black Twitter. It goes crazy. <laughs> it goes crazy. So that night, we had a Q&A ready to go with you because I wanted everybody tweeting about Queen Sugar to realize that you were a trans actor playing mm -hmm. that part and that they hadn't hired some random cis guy to play the part. And um, and so yeah, that was the key moment and opportunity for you to be willing to say, hey, you've been hiring me in all these roles. Mm -hmm. I also happen to be a trans guy and you can hire me for trans guy roles as well. And the next thing you're gonna do that's really big is the L word Generation Q. Yes, yes. I'm, v I'm very excited about that because uh, the, the first iteration of the L word, I, I was really excited to watch when they announced they were gonna have a trans masculine character on it. But it, it, I don't know how much information the people who were working in the room knew about actual trans people. So there was a lot of problematic things with that character. But this time around, there's, uh, there's trans people in the writer's room. Um, you know, they're hiring different trans characters with like different stories. I'm, uh, you know, they're humans. It's, it's way, it's, I mean, a lot of the impact, I think from the last like, you know, six years of work that you've been doing at Glad and work that the people in the writer's room have been doing it is, is really manifesting in this, in this version of the show. And I'm very excited to be working on it. Well, to that end, because my timekeeper's over here letting me know that somehow we're nearly at the end, which makes me really sad. Um, I want to end by saying, okay, so we've talked about the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the past, and the really promising place that we're in in this moment where we have some amazing creators and some phenomenal actors bringing these characters to life. What does the future look like? So I said I run a support group for families with trans kids, and so yeah, I've done that for the last 10 years, and it's a lot of like 14, 13, 15-year-old trans kids coming in, and they're still looking to see themselves. And sometimes they still say, well, I just watched Boys Don't Cry because I didn't know what else to watch. And like, okay, great, but that's not the main thing I want them to see. So what do we want to see? Like, where do we want trans representation on television to be five years from now, 10 years from now? Like, what's the dream? Like, I've always said when people ask about <clears throat> Pose and they ask about the success of success in air quotes of the show. Success and Emmy nominations, thank well, you very much. Which is lovely, um, but everyone has a different definition of success. So I think, you know, if your barometer for success is awards, then sure, Pose is successful. But um, but I say that I say it in that way because I think for me, I've always felt and I've said this since the beginning of the first season, success will be when our women can go off beyond pose and be cast in any role and that they're not specifically being called as a trans woman to play a trans character but they're just hey you're a really wonderful performer and we really love you for this role and why that's important i think because some people get into the slippery slope argument or false equivalencies like when transgender actors are cast to play roles that aren't explicitly transgender it allows audiences to see us as the men and women that we are, or the non-binary people that we are. In, in other words, it's like, oh yeah, Jamie Clayton can play a trans woman on Sense8, but she can also play a PTA soccer mom on some other show, 
um, because she's, you know, a woman. So there's a way in which casting transgender actors to play roles that aren't explicitly trans is a way of letting audiences see us as our true selves and validating our real identities, which, yes, is trans. But, like, I transitioned 22 years ago. If I didn't do it for a living, I wouldn't talk about being trans every day. You know what I mean? So, anyway, my point is, yes, that's an awesome barometer of what the future looks like. What else? I'm going to get... Uh, it's going to be all about me for a second. Okay, <laughs> but it does, I, I echo all of that for me personally as an actor, but it goes back to what you said about kids. My wife, you heard it here first, Miranda Russo wrote, and, uh, wrote a pilot. It is a one hour teen dramedy. It is my so-called life in Freaks and Geeks for the queer community. And I'm gonna be the executive producer. So that's all gonna, that's gonna be new. That's gonna be kids. In a, in a, I can't, oh, there's so much I can't say, but I could tell you that. <laughs> and I'm, and hearing your story about selling, I'm like, okay, it's gonna sell. It's gonna sell. <laughs> it's gonna be sell, and then there's gonna be more shows like it. It's not gonna be the only one hour team dramedy, team dramedy, it is a team making it possible, but like, it's not gonna be the only one on TV with these LGBTQ plus characters in it where the stories are around them, but it's also about their community, it's about the allies, it's about the time, you know, the, the climate, it's about, it could be about so many other things. And so I think kids are gonna be really excited to see that, and when you change kids' lives, they go on to change the future after that. Agreed. So it'll just snowball into success for everyone, not just me and my wife and my family. Can I just piggyback on that really quickly yeah. and say the following, which is, it's not just that the show that you and your wife are, want to sell is going to sell, it's that it has to sell. Like it's imperative that every single one of you, whatever your art is as a creative, that you have to do it. Like you have to persist, you have to push past all the rhetoric and do it. You know, because as Nick has mentioned earlier, like there are people's lives out in the world who depend on the work that everyone up on this panel is doing. So you have to push past it. That show has to get made. And whatever idea lives in you right now, do it, make it, push past it to make that happen. Last year, we had over 500 original scripted pieces of content. It's crazy to think that with Transparent ending, Transparent and Pose are the only two shows that have trans people in those, you know what I mean? It's, it's everything that you just said earlier, right? Well, no, it was 11. Well, 11 shows, 15 characters, but uh, Transparent and Pose are the only two that have more than one character. And those are the only shows that's, like it's literally in the title of Transparent, <laughs> and Pose is it also about yeah, trans people. So it exactly. means that over 500 shows and only two shows are centering trans people. Like that's not okay, and if you think that's okay, then that's a problem. So. Yeah, your show has to sell because we need it and we need all the work that you all are going to create at some point as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great note to end on, but I'm not going to end on it because I do want to hear from, from other folks if I can get the time. So, Lily, you are a visionary. Um, just to, your vision uh, of how, where we are. I was, just gonna, <laughs> I was just going to do some cheerleading as well. I think like exactly what Stephen is saying, that that is like part of Alex's uh, revolution. Like we all have to break the fucking door down and tell our stories because it's about education, it's about having a voice. And like all of the storytellers up here and all of you in this room, it's like that's, it just is, is part of this larger conversation that we're having when we're finding the language to talk about ourselves. It's about empathy and like, it's also about listening. We have to learn how to listen to each other. That's all. Brian. I feel like um, having, I think the future for me would be there's trans people, there's trans talent reps, there's trans executives, there's just, there's more representation in the in the places outside of the creative spaces. I, I mean, because there are, we're in here, we're doing our thing, but then we have to knock on doors, we have to ask people to like, please listen to our story. No, I'd rather have some of us already there, like bring us the stories because I, I got the end. So the future for me is like, we're in all levels of the industry and we're able to to center the stories that need to be told, whether it involves trans people or not, but just as many and more trans decision makers, more queer decision makers, you know, so please open these doors, do these internships, stop making people shadow you, hire them you know hire us and hire us beyond the cre the you know the creative spots you know i feel like that's what the future will look like to me
fantastic. Alexandra. Oh, yeah. Listen. <laughs> you, well, listen to me. You, your job as an artist, whether it's an audience member or it's uh, in the center of the creation, is a responsibility. So you have a responsibility to open a door so that everyone behind that door can be seen. This is not something you do because you're bored. This isn't something that you do because it's a, it, it passes the time. Art is literally the human experience. It is the dialogue we create in order to speak to people that don't speak our language. So if you're doing nothing, you are part of the problem. You are part of the problem. You are what's stopping people, marginalized and otherized, from living their life fully. If you're not doing something artistic every day of your life, you are part of the problem because lives are being lost. Let me tell you something. It is a revolutionary act for a trans person of color to walk out my front door. People want to murder me, murder me. We're being systematically assassinated in this country because of what we are. If you are doing nothing, if you are staying silent, and let me tell you what you can do. It's really simple. It's easy and it's simple. Have a conversation with anybody, someone you don't know about what it's like to live in this country as you. You have a story to tell, humans. Your story matters, it's important, it takes up space, not only in you, but in the universe at large. That's why you're here. I mean on the planet, not in this room. That's why you're here, on the planet, to tell your story. If you're not telling your story, you're part of the problem. If you're not having dialogue about who you are every single day, you're part of the problem. And if you're part of the problem, you don't get to complain. I am really tired of hearing this generation, your generation, the younger people, I'm talking about you, kids 30 years old and younger, y'all are children. I am sick and tired of hearing you complain about the government, about the, your fundamental rights, about this country, about what it stands for, about the elections. I am tired of hearing your words. I'm also tired of hearing I'm sorry. I'm tired of your apologies. I want ownership. I want you to take ownership of the problems because all of us are responsible for all of us. The minute we begin to separate ourselves from our stories, is the minute we begin to create war. And that is unacceptable. Every day, every moment is precious. If you're missing a moment, you miss everything. Uh-huh, yes, I, yes. Follow Alexandra Billings on Instagram for a lot more of that content because she is a genius at it. Follow all of our fantastic panelists. I want to thank them very much for sharing their stories tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank the TV Academy Foundation for creating this space for us to talk about the power of TV and how it can genuinely change lives. And I want to thank Walt Disney Television for making it possible. And thank all of you for driving to wherever the heck we are on a Thursday night. <laughs> See you all next time. <laughs>